All right, today's topic is how creative is Vietnam? Can we start the next creative capital here? We have three amazing content creators hopping on stage in a bit. First, we're going to introduce Vaughn. Please hop on stage. Actually, you should have done you should start with On first. It's reading off the paper, by the way. So On is the host of Etc. Uh, he does one of the best podcasts I listen to quite frequently here. I think it's pretty funny because my VDM is actually pretty terrible, but I still manage to listen to his podcast. <laughs> the next person I have is uh, Vicky. So Vicky is a TikTok content creator, and social media manager of, of StoryCo. The last person is Ben. He's the CEO and content creator of What the Fuck? Yeah. All right. So before we start out with the main questions for this panel, we're going to do a rapid fire question first. We're going to go down the line, starting with Van, to Vicky, to On. And the part, and basically, we're gonna, I'm just going to say two things, right? You guys choose one of them. This, all, all these questions relate to content creation. The first question is, short form content or long form content? Definitely long form content. Wow. Both. Both. Uh, also both, but personally, I prefer long form content. And we'll go down this way. We'll go like ping pong it for fun. So the next question is memes or text only? Memes with text. <laughs> you guys are not very good at this. <laughs> These options are not that good. <laughs> text, text can now also become memes. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Ben. Text with memes. So regarding a working environment, do you guys prefer a coffee shop or a quiet studio? Mm, coffee shop. I prefer coffee shop just because like seeing people around me working is peer pressure. So So you like peer pressure? Yeah. Uh, me too. <laughs> uh, coffee shop as well. Um, those of you who know me will know that I have a caffeine addiction and um, it's really bad. So. I need coffee, but I also need to be outside if I want to be productive. Yeah, so I'm going to answer that question too. I love the coffee shops here. There's so many options, like every single street, every single block, so definitely coffee shops for sure. Next question. And I'm not sure this is a rapid fire question, but I see it on my list anyway, so I'm just going to ask it. So, An, what's a creative icon that significantly influences your work? Creative icon. Um, do you guys know Thuy Ming? <laughs> well, she, she's my boss, so um, oh, the, the reason why I started doing the money date was because of her, so I, I own it a lot to her. Um, I like a blogger called Tim Urban. Tim Urban, so he has a blog called Wait But Why, and I love his storytelling. I love his storytelling and how he can see the world in a very creative way. Um, one of my idols, I guess, uh, is Miss Mina. She is Korean American. Uh, she based in Seattle. She does uh, food content, and her content is very fun and uh, very authentic. Yeah. And I guess the final rapid fire question is. What is the most unconventional source of inspiration for your projects? I think is on a grab bike. Because, yes, that's the reason why I don't drive here in Vietnam. Because <laughs> most of my ideas are from uh, a grab bike. Yeah, just looking and then just getting more ideas. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean with that. I get my best ideas when my grab bike is going so fast. I'm like, oh no, I need to type this down. I might lose my phone. <laughs> But yeah, uh, Vicky, what about yourself? That is actually such a coincidence because I have a Facebook page where I collect conversations with the taxi drivers I have, and that's where some of the craziest and funniest stories come from. Okay, what about you, An? Am I just boring? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I can't think of any activity in particular or unconventional where I draw inspiration from. For me, it's just like, 
going through the day to day and you know meeting people and, and just observing what's going on. Um, nothing, nothing special, really. No, you gotta share more of your secret sauce, man. I, I've been watching your podcast. All right. No, I, I, I don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're gonna dive into three questions, and these questions are obviously pertaining to how creativity is formed in Vietnam. So the first question is, I'm gonna ask Vicky first. So Vicky, what are some common stereotypes associated with overseas content creators, and how do you think these perceptions are formed? What is correct and what is not correct? So I think the first stereotype when people think of overseas content creators is zoi và zou, so young, uh, smart and rich. And the perception of this is because people think that if you're able to afford studying abroad, you have to be rich and you have to be smart. Or if you're coming back from abroad, then your family abroad must have made like a significant amount of money for you to be able to come back. I think mostly people have a positive reaction towards overseas people like Jenny Huang or like Britannia Karma, they like you. Um, but it's also very easy to like overstep that line from being like, you know, smart and like rich to acting in a way that makes you seem entitled and very uh, condescending. So sometimes when overseas creators create content, they'll say things like, oh, it's so like developed where I'm from and in Vietnam, it's like this and this. So that does not really land well with the Vietnamese audience. And it's good that we have these global experiences, but when we talk about them, we frame them in a way that it's like another perspective, but it's not like necessarily better. It's just, you know, a way of seeing that we want to share with the audience. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Van, what about yourself? I think I have a similar question, a uh, similar answer as well, because I'm not sure um, what people assume about overseas Vietnamese content creators. But for me, when I do my YouTube channel, I look through the comment section, and a lot of people said that I, I need to have a lot of money to start my YouTube channel. But in fact, I started my YouTube channel with an iPhone 7 in a military camp. So I was recording my journey, and then uh, people started liking my content. So that's why it became my career now. Uh, and I know a lot of uh, my friends who came back to Vietnam and then uh, started a YouTube channel with nothing. And then now he and she or she can grow her income like 10x compared to um, their previous jobs. Um, but it can be true though, because I know that a lot of people are successful on YouTube because of their luxury life, like Thai Gong or Khoa Pak. Uh, so I feel like the stereotype can be true um, based on like the definition or like the people that you talk to, or it can be false uh, for people, especially people who are in that situation, who have been through um, like the journey, so yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm gonna ask the next question because I feel like the, this question is actually very similar. Oh, I have a good answer for the other one, but okay, that's fine. <laughs> but it's a similar question yeah, though. Yeah, yeah. How do you balance the global insights you gained with, local, with the local Vietnamese context and your content creation? Um, so... And you can answer the first one too. Yeah, yeah, touching on the previous question a little bit, I think this comment might resonate with a lot of people here as well, but, um, and I, I'm definitely guilty of it sometimes, but I get a lot of comments, especially when I did that episode with Steven when he was speaking entirely in Vietnamese. And um, there were a lot of comments saying that, thằng này là thằng mất gốc. It's like, you don't, like, your, your Vietnamese is not good, like, you don't know anything about Vietnam or the culture and whatever. So th that kind of comment I get a lot, and I think it's, also kind of a stereotype that people have of like Vietnamese returnees or overseas Vietnamese coming back to Vietnam. Um, but rather than looking at it as a shortcoming, I think um, to your question, I think how do we marry the global insights or the international experience that we've had over the years with the kind of content that you make for the local audience here? Like finding that balance is very important. So for example, I have to, because my podcast is on personal finance and your relationship with money, there's a lot of things that I have to unlearn from my time in the U.S. Because, you know, Americans, their relationship with money is different. Um, their, you know, just their financial products are already different from, like, a lot of the 
the products and the habits here that we have in Vietnam. So I'm learning a lot of that and also um, learning about how people view money here, their background, their story, um, how they make money from their job. It's been a great learning experience, just like finding the balance between the two. So follow-up question real quick. What, is the, what are some of the stuff that you unlearn that you mentioned? Uh, stuff about credit card usage, stuff about <laughs> uh, consumerism and, and things like that. But I, you, you do see a lot of it being translated in the, in the Vietnamese context, but I think there are still like cultural and fundamental values that are different uh, between the two countries. Oh, wow. Yeah. What about you, Vicky? So, um, I create content on TikTok, and actually my audience is primarily local Vietnamese people. And I want to share some insights about Vietnamese netizens. I find that Vietnamese netizens are very easily excited. They love drama. It's very easy for you to go viral. But it's also very easy for you, you to, you know, it's easy for them to go from loving you to hating you overnight, and then for them to completely forget about you like three days later. So I think like um, with people like that, like Vietnamese netizens are, I think they are, Vietnamese people are some of the most hospitable people, but Vietnamese netizens are some of the most brutal people. And you know that um, like Vietnamese people, like when Vietnam got ranked like the number one, like most polluted uh, city, they went and they rated the app Air Visual like one star so much that it got removed from the app store. And you know, if they lose like a football game, they will report the referees page until it like disappears. So these are the kind of people that we're dealing with. So when you share information about, you know, your experiences abroad, I think framing for me has been the most crucial element, like framing it in a way, never saying that this is better or this is this and that, but it's just like this is a different way. Uh, and they can get to experience like being abroad like vicariously through you. Uh, or I make content about education, so I talk a lot about how like learning English was when I was in England or how teachers treated their students. So parents look at that and they're like, oh, this is something I can learn from to teach my students, uh, my child children. But I never say that this is better than the Vietnamese way, yeah. Ooh, that's, that's a good tip. I don't want to be a content creator in Vietnam anymore. It sounds dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what about you, Van? For me, I feel like it's very hard to balance out um, things here when I moved back to Vietnam. Uh, so they said integration without um, assimilation, like hoa nhập chứ không hoa tan. And um, I was born in Hanoi, where there are a lot of traditions. Like uh, you guys know, because you guys are born in, were born in Hanoi too. There's a, a lot of like etiquette and unspoken rules. I remember when I was younger, I was taught not to be loud and just humble, and um, not to like interfere people and don't interrupt people. But when I went to the U.S. at the age of 17, with like very minimal English and with very um, <laughs> like I don't even know the culture. So when I went to the U.S., I had like the culture shock when people um, were like making fun of each other and Americans are very assertive. They express their uh, in individualism. Yeah, so that's why like when I moved back to Vietnam three years ago, I had reverse culture shock. Uh, like sometimes when I speak English, I forget some vocabulary. And sometimes when I speak Vietnamese, I forget some Vietnamese vocabulary. So now it's not bilingual anymore, it's bi bilingual. <laughs> yeah, and then like, I feel like I'm a like half ripe banana, like white inside and then like yellow outside, Michigander inside, but Hanoian outside. And I found it very hard to express myself in some way. And I was questioning myself like who I am, where I'm at right now, what am I, am I doing? So like in 2022, I had like a ident identity crisis. Yeah, and then I, I know a lot of you in here, like you guys, sometimes you have that moment too, like that you feel lost and you don't know where home is. Yeah, so for me, like luckily I overcame that time and I, I realized that instead of looking at the negative size of, of it, now I build a set of skills and I have different versions of myself 
and I, I think I can adapt to any environment that I can um, have the opportunity to go. Uh, and especially it does build um, more like empathy in me because now I can understand um, people more. So for example, in Vietnam, people usually ask personal questions like, Chị bao nhiêu tuổi? How old are you? Did you have a family? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so now I don't feel mad anymore when people ask about my age because I know that uh, they just want to address the right pronoun to show respect. Uh, like, am chị, hopefully they don't call me go because <laughs> I would be sad. But yeah, uh, but I feel like I become a better version um, when I have both Western and Eastern cultures in me. Yeah, I think that's a good segue for the next question. We'll also start with Yvonne. The next question is, in what way do you think the unique, what, let me repeat that. In what ways do you think the unique perspectives of overseas creators can enrich the, the Vietnamese content landscape? I feel like one of the most important factor um, that boosts view for my YouTube channel is the, I call it the contrast effect. So one of my most viewed video was called What Not To Do In Vietnam. So like in the title, it does have the word not. Um, so when people come here, they only know the things to do in Vietnam. Uh, but only native Vietnamese who was born and raised here, they know the culture, they know the etiquette, so they can tell you what not to do here in Vietnam. And then a lot of people didn't know that, so that's why it got them very interested um, in seeing um, different perspectives. Um, so I feel like having that um, can contribute a lot in the um, successful process of making content. I appreciate you sharing that. So, on, I want to hear from you. Oh, what about Vicky? Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> yeah. The question is, in what ways do you think the unique perspectives of OV creators can enrich the Vietnamese content landscape? Uh, I think it's, a lot of it is personal experience and the kind of, uh, perspectives that you provide as a content creator because I feel like everyone goes through a very unique and different experience in terms of um, you know where they where they grew up where they go to school where they're now where they're at in life um, and I noticed that you know in content nowadays like authenticity is very important um, and what what is authentic authenticity is like built from it's built from just per, like living your life and building up your personal experience so as long as you you know know how to package that experience to make it attractive for people to see then you're I mean I feel like everyone here is kind of a content creator in a way you know you take a picture you post it on your story that's content it's not it's not rocket science so um, I think just showing your your authenticity through like the very simple um, sharing of a story or sharing of a post is already enough to like contribute to the, the, the content landscape of Vietnam. Vicky. So I think um, there's a lot of specific experiences that you'll only go through if you've ever lived abroad. And those experiences Vietnamese people will never know unless you share it with them. For instance, many Vietnamese audiences that I have or many Vietnamese people I know go their entire lives without ever meeting like a black person or, you know, never knowing what it feels like to be an ethnic minority. I know that when we're Asian and we live abroad, a lot of the times Asian people are the ethnic minority, so we know what discrimination feels like, so we know what, you know, microaggression feels like. But most of us, when we come to Vietnam, we're part of the Qing ethnic majority. So those experiences and, you know, things that you go through will provide a new perspective. And even if you think it's something that's very, like just what you do at work or how your boss communicates with you or something you're going through in everyday life and you think, oh, who would care about this? This is so like normal. Why would I even bother like recording this? But you'd be so surprised to see that when you do record it and you share it, people are like, oh, this is like so new and interesting to me. So for instance, a content creator called Bino Chem Ding Ang, he just shared something very simple about living in Australia is that people don't wear shoes in the summer. They just walk around barefoot. And then all the Vietnamese this people true? <laughs> went Idiot. like wild in the comments. They were like, I can't believe people just walk inside the supermarket with no shoes. So it's like, 
even if you think it's something super obvious, like how I share that my boss uh, has a public Google calendar that the employees can subscribe to, so to understand what's going on, people were like, wow, this is like so new to me. So I think if you just like look at what you're doing and then think what might be different from, you know, what my Vietnamese friends are seeing and share that, that would already be like something massively like new and interesting. No, that's really, really good insight. Thank you for sharing that. So we have one final question before we open up to Q&A. And the final question, we're gonna ask, uh, hmm, who should we ask first? We'll go, ahead. We'll go with Vaughn first. So uh, what opportunities exist in Vietnam's current creative landscapes for OV creators? I think according to um, the Influencer Marketing Hub, <laughs> the influencer marketing is worth 21.1 uh, billion US dollars. Um, yeah, it's a huge industry. And also like in 2023, 71% um, of, of the Vietnam population use social media. Um, like the top are Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube, where content creators can make income from um, those social media platforms. So for me, I think um, content industry is thriving very rapidly in Vietnam. Uh, however, with the developing economy, nurturing art and uh, culture is not the top priority for the government and the people. So uh, when I teach my student at my uh, YouTube, I always tell them to just do it as a hobby first. Like don't think it's the main hobby. Um, and then like, uh, sorry, main um, job. And then like when they see the result, they can just keep going with it. Um, and also is thriving very fast. So you, like you need to um, keep up to date with the trends. However, the reason why I answer the question long form or short form, I still choose long form because long form, um, I, I can stick with evergreen content. And then for short form videos, is like I have to keep up with the trends and it creates burnout. And I feel like people, uh, my followers from YouTube, they are more loyal. Yeah, and then I can build and uh, maintain strong connection with them, yes. Uh, but most importantly, just be yourself, be authentic. And when you are yourself, you create value and you bring value to people, um, yeah, success will chase you. Thank you. Uh, quick follow-up question. What is your favorite social media platform and why? YouTube. YouTube. Yes, okay. yeah, because it's long form, evergreen mm -hmm. content, and then um, it converts better. Converts better. That's, I like that. Vicky, what about yourself? Um, so opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. I think that overseas Vietnamese have a lot of opportunities because you guys bring, uh, we bring like a lot of new perspectives as well. I think there's a lot of room for growth in content creation market in Vietnam, but most of like the vloggers and long form content creators we see now are still, I think, in like a safe zone. For instance, it's very like daily vlogs or like, uh, you know, this and that reviews. We don't have like crazy YouTubers like Mr. Beast who are like, oh, do this challenge and then I'll give you like a million dollars or like people who change like Max Fosh who like uh, I trick people into thinking this is the wrong airport. There's no like, there's not a lot of like really, really creative ideas like that yet. And then in international YouTube, if you go up, there's like lots of mini like documentaries and movies. There's like not, not a lot of that kind of content in Vietnam yet. So if you really want to be like crazy creative, then you would be one of the first movers in the Vietnam market. But even if you want to go on the more casual side, then I think you would be bringing a lot of new perspective as well. And the advantage is that people already have like a positive bias towards you. Like when we say, hear somebody going back from Vietnam, like most people will look at it positively and people will be very curious to see what you have to share. So I think definitely try it out, yeah. Wait, quick question. So my Vietnamese is really, really bad. So how do you say beast in Vietnamese? Please. Beast. Yeah. Guai Vat. Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, someone could be like Mr. How do you say Mr. Mr. Guai Vat. 
Whoa, <laughs> <laughs> that's my next username. Uh, okay, so quick, same question for you. What is your favorite social, me social media platform and why? I think for me, Instagram, because Instagram is, I feel like one of the only platforms where people converse like on a personal level. And when you meet somebody, you like ask them for their Instagram first before you ask them for their YouTube channel. Uh, yeah. <laughs> who, has a, who just has a YouTube channel? <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, you know. Back me up, back me up. <laughs> Um, opportunities. I think, again, like opportunities are everywhere uh, if you want to be a content creator because I feel like the, the process of creating content now is just so, like it's, it's so easy. Um, I do have a question for the audience. Um, how many of you have thought about starting a podcast? or a YouTube channel, or something to make content. Some of you are lying. <laughs> you guys have thought about it. Uh, but what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at here is, I, as you can see, like almost the majority of the people in this room have thought about starting something in content, and I think it just speaks to the, um, the I guess, the, the easiness and the convenience of doing that now. Um, yeah, I, I just think opportunities are everywhere and, and um, uh, a lot of you, when you, do you guys consume content about Vietnam? Uh, just a quick shout out, like what, like what do you guys watch? Like food content, travel content, what is it? Mukbang. Mukbang, okay. Vun, you're good. <laughs> Me, actually, I, I also have another addiction. It is watching mukbang before going to bed. <laughs> before going to bed. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think for me, like, um, creating content, you, you make the kind of content that's closest to your heart and what you normally watch. Um, so if you uh, open my photo album right now, you'll see that a lot of the videos are just of me eating. Because I love watching people eat. So for me, it's just like, oh, why don't I just do the same thing? Um, whether I post them or not, it's a different story. But I mean, some of the content that you make, you don't necessarily post. But it's about, uh, it's about the process of like thinking about it, creating it, and just having it on your phone. Maybe sometime in the future, you can post it. But yeah, content creation is everywhere and uh, like anytime. I do agree with that. So when I got asked to become a moderator, I watch everyone's content. He does eat a lot on his Instagram, so check it out. But if I have to pick which uh, platform is my favorite social media platform, maybe this is unpopular, but does anyone use Twitter? You mean X? X. <laughs> I refuse to call it X. <laughs> but I, I, I love X slash Twitter because I... Um, I was one of the, f kind of like the first groups of users of Twitter back in Vietnam in like 2008, 2009. Uh, but even to this day, like Twitter is my source of news, it's my source of memes, um, it's my source of questionable content, but um, everything that you need to find, it's on Twitter. And I like the community aspect of it, um, how a lot of people are, um, you know, they authentically, they share about their knowledge and their experience. Um, yeah, so Twitter for me awesome. and YouTube. So that sort of wraps up our questions for this panel. But before I open it up for audience questions, I do want to give a chance for people to follow these awesome content creators. So we'll go down the line. How can people find out more about you and reach out to you? On what is your handle? Oh, oh, oh my in your social, social media, media handle. Account? Hmm. Which account do you have? Uh. I guess the best way is Instagram. What is your user handle? Uh, An Chuang G G. So An Chuang with t two extra G's. Yeah. Okay. Can we not have him on the screen? <laughs> <Let's see. laughs> QR code on the screen. We do not. That's good advice for next time. Yeah. Vicky, what about yourself? Mine is uh, Vicky Zap Jap. Uh, the same with no space in the middle on both Instagram and TikTok. Okay. Uh, Van. Uh, so my is the YouTube call What the Fu, yeah. But my real name is Van Vu. It was so funny that like, there was a like y actually yesterday there was a guy like 
driving by, and he was like, on a grab bike, and he was pointing, pointing at me. He was like, oh, fur. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my real name is actually Bun, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, I would take that as a compliment. And myself, it's Asian Hustle Network, so feel free to reach out anytime. But with that being said, we're opening up to the audience now for questions. All right, Mr. Henry Bao. Hello. Please stand up and introduce yourself real oh. quick. <laughs> no, just kidding. Go yes, ahead. What's yes, your question? Yes. Hello. Um, my name is Henry V. Bao, and I'm a, yeah, I'm a new content creator. I'm going to launch my channel this year. I put it off for a few years now, and this is the right time. So learned a lot from you guys today, and thank you so much. My question has to do with, um, I really want to understand, so, you know, Vun, you connect with the global audience who want to come to Vietnam. Vicky, you, your content is in Vietnamese, correct? And An, you speak Vietnamese, but you're you know, from New York and you went to Brown. Yeah. My question is, how do you connect the local and global audience a bit more when you share content? Um, yesterday, when I talked to Hua, who's a chef, he, oh, <laughs> who does you know, food content in English, he said, you know, there's... If you do content in Vietnamese, you're serving the local audience. If you do in English, and it's more global, but I want to create content that serves both audiences. So do I create two channels? Do, do I just separate my audiences? Could you talk a bit more about bridging that gap? Yeah, thank you. First of all, can I ask you what social media platform you want to, to create? YouTube, podcast, TikTok. Yeah. And I already have an Instagram and Facebook. And LinkedIn, I'm also starting to write on LinkedIn. So, <laughs> yeah. so that's why I have a hard time, you know, just playing it out. Yeah. Love time your what? advice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I can share first. So from my experience creating uh, long-form content, I think you should just focus on one um, audience, yeah, target audience. So. When I first started my YouTube channel, my uh, strategy is to just focus on um, international followers. Because first of all, I can make more money on YouTube. <laughs> Second of all, I can introduce Vietnam to the world. Because there are a lot of YouTubers um, travel around Vietnam and talk about beautiful things about Vietnam to Vietnamese in Vietnamese language. So I found that opportunity uh, in the YouTube industry, so that's why I jumped into that. Uh, so it was not a very difficult path for me to grow on YouTube. But then I realized that a lot of Vietnamese follow my channel to learn English. So there's like 10% of them watch my channel. And uh, yeah, but then like my focus is still international audience. Uh, and just small percentage of it is um, from Vietnam. Yeah, so um, it makes it easier for me to choose the language I'm going to speak in my channel, also the content as well. Yeah, because they have different insights. Um, so yeah, đừng tham quá anh ạ. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you everyone for sharing your perspective. Uh, my name is Sun, I'm Swiss uh, Vietnamese, and I work in HR, so for, forgive me, I will uh, ask you an uh, HR-related question. <laughs> when do you see yourself in 10 years professionally? This is why I don't work for corporates anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, where do I see myself in 10 years professionally, you said? What am I doing tomorrow? I don't even know. Uh, but I don't know. I, my sort of like my, my exposure to content in the creative industry has only recently started. Um, so it just opened up a lot of new opportunities for me and uh, I'm still in the process of, you know, considering all of them and, and figure th figuring things out. So I'm, I, I 
haven't really thought about you know what I'm doing 10 years from now, but all I know is I want to be in. I've decided that I want to be in the creative industry, and that can mean you know starting my own channel, start like building my own platform and making my own content. Um, so yeah, just very general like directions that I know, um, but exactly where I'm gonna be 10 years from now professionally. I don't know, maybe the Met Gala <laughs> as a host, <laughs> I don't know. Goals. <laughs> yeah. That's it, yeah. Um, so thank you, Brian, and all the panelists. Um, so just quick intro to myself, and I'll get to my question. Um, my name's Tony. Um, so I am actually just started my own TikTok channel t uh, two days ago, and post my first uh, video and get uh, 5,000 views. And honestly, I'm so happy in the room today. I, I never thought I would be in the room of creative. Uh, I have 10 years experience in management consulting and run a career education in the US, but I want to impact more, more people in Vietnam. So career education, job search coaching, those kind of thing. Um, so my question to you is like, how do, um, I would love to learn about your research inside uh, so to plan for the content, like how you identify the content, to balance between like something you predict the user will want to view versus something you want to do? That's the first question. And the second question is like, after you've done it for a while, have you cracked the code, like the formula to be viral? Because sometimes I feel it's just so lucky, like you both in one platform, it go viral and all of them, it's not. So in any like kind of like insight into like viral framework success, kind of like, would love to hear your view on this. Thank you. I think for your first question about what balancing what you want to do and what uh, the followers want, um, I think we need to do both. And sometimes you will create content that you know that people are asking you for, uh, and you create, and then you create content that you want to do for yourself. And the, the, for the one that you want to do for yourself, you don't stress about the views, right? Uh, I think for going viral. Going viral on Instagram and going viral on TikTok is completely different. The videos that go viral on TikTok don't go viral on Instagram and vice versa. And, but I think for TikTok specifically, because you're asking about TikTok, one of the things to go viral is, first of all, is the hook, right? You have to have the great first five seconds. And then it can be something surprising, like Ben said, like what not to do, or like this is what I would do again, or my biggest mistake, or my biggest regret doing this and that. Um, and then you have the teaser in the first 10 seconds, and then after that you get into the content. Um, and I think that the thing that makes things go viral is if you have like a controversial opinion or a new idea, because people will tag each other in the comments and they'll send it, or they'll like tell you, no, you're wrong. And then the more people argue with you, the more the video goes viral. So drama. <laughs> drama is key. No, but like, it's true. Like, if you like, share an idea, a lot of the times people don't comment, but if you say something they disagree with, like 10 people will come and comment. All right, oh, thank you guys for attending the panel. I apologize to you, I feel bad. Uh, but thank you to our, our panelists. Uh, so thank you everyone, give a round of applause. Thank you. All right, thank you everybody.